Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I am Louise Palenker. As we always do, we start with our suggestions on great media for you to consume. Then we'll talk to a talented person who has conquered the media. Our guest today, Conchetta Tomei, a beautifully recognizable face that you've seen on a wide range of movies and television series like in films, one of the greatest titles in the history of film, Don't Tell Mama the Babysitter's Dead with Christina Applegate in television, China Beach, a, a wonderful show, and tons more. We're going to give her a proper introduction shortly, but first I have some uh, uh, self-congratulatory messages to read from our listeners. Media Path listeners are not only among those with discerning tastes, but are some of the nicest people out there, and there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that proves it, but every time an example comes in, we like to share it with you. So here's a recent review we received on Apple Podcasts we would like to bestow on you. From Lauren853, a lovely and cozy podcast. Mm. We're like a fire in a fireplace, Mm -hmm. an eggnog. Listening to this podcast was cozy. It felt like watching a familiar and nostalgic television show. Their voices are soothing, and their content was fantastic. They did a great job on their research, and I thoroughly enjoyed listening. Are we related to this person? I don't believe so. Okay. Do you know who Lauren853? I don't know who that no, is. No, I know Lauren857. Oh, okay. And, of course, if you leave us a review, we'll share it on the show as well. Please rate, like, follow, and do as this recent YouTube commenter did. This was on our interview with Jerry Mathers and his mom. This is from Cheryl. She says, love this. His parents were wonderful at raising him. I absolutely agree with that. Subscribe. So everywhere you may be watching or listening, be like Cheryl. Hit the subscribe button button and uh, we will we'll get it on the air for you wheezy what do you have this week i've been watching tv fritz oh i know you have and you knew this day would come and i know that not making it past producer callbacks was painful but we do need to talk about the golden bachelor <laughs> okay the golden bachelor is 72 year old gary he spells it jerry but pronounces it gary he's a sweetheart don't trouble him with spelling bees Golden Gary was in the restaurant business. He lost his wife eight years ago just after he had retired and they had moved into their lakeside dream home. He has two grown daughters and grandchildren. In the ads, Golden Gary looks like slick, Bond-like perfection. But spend a minute watching him and your immediate takeaway is kindness. I was also prepared to suspect the motives of the boomer bachelorettes, but thus far they seem lovely, well-intentioned, and prior to dates they've been doing each other's hair. On The Golden Bachelor, excitement builds as the bachelorettes move into the mansion and immediate concerns include navigating bunk beds on brand new knees, shelf space for pill caddies, and nocturnal access to bathrooms. And then the first date card arrives and the full textures of personalities begin to unfold. Having traveled a bit of their life roads and learned and grown and fallen down and carried on, the backstories are compelling and meaningful. The Golden Bachelor reaffirms that the eternal truth of our shared human experience is that at any age, at every age, we long to be understood, to be validated, and to feel connected. Will Golden Gary find love? Will the inevitable pickleball group date devolve into a hair-pulling brawl? Will Gary find a special soulmate named Gertrude who spells it with a J? In the warm glow of Golden Gary, all is possible. Watch The Golden Bachelor on ABC and Hulu. So is it successful? Oh, my God, people. Dina, the the internet is like... I, you, I saw Michael Rappaport... A TikTok video where he's extolling the virtues of the Golden Bachelor. Well, so. I'm so happy because this is my demographic. Yeah. And in describing this show, you describe my act, my whole act. <laughs> Unassisted living is about that same thing. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm so thankful that they're talking to people that were born in the last century. And the guy's even younger than I am. Which and is learning from sad. us because we have a lot and we have a lot that we've experienced that we would love to share with you. No, I agree. All right, I I want to talk about um, a a four-part series on Netflix called Beckham. I I, personally, I don't care about soccer, football. You sit around with bloodshot eyes for an hour and a half waiting for one goal. But this is a four-part series about David Beckham, one of the greatest players in the history of the game. This guy's fame made him way bigger than the sport, even. The series starts out 
with his upbringing by a football-obsessed father who drills this little boy from the time he was a toddler, never settling for anything less than perfection. Then we're into David being discovered as a football wonderkind, getting scouted and recruited by Manchester United when he was 15 years old. After that, the rocket to stardom. Now, the second episode, in my mind, is the episode. Everyone is aware of the hostility of the British tabloid press. Ruthless, relentless in their coverage of all famous Brits, the royal family, anybody in the limelight. But one fateful day, Beckham makes a bad play in an all-England championship game, and things get really dark. The entire British Empire ices him. For nearly a year, the media... The fans, everybody eviscerated him. They threatened his family, including his wife's uh, Posh Spice. They send him bullets in the mail. It was profound and disturbing. He would get thunderous boos when he would walk out onto the pitch from both his home fans and the competitors as well. Eventually, all was forgiven when he made a couple of heroic plays in the following season. This brought the most interesting part of the series for me, the display of his character. Hard to understand how he faced the angry things thousands week after week for a year but the physical and emotional guts he showed were superhuman in episodes three and four he gets traded to real madrid and then he ends up taking over the team in miami which was the one responsible for bringing the goat right now the greatest of all time right now who is a lionel messi from argentina david's steel nerves his model and movie star looks at the same time and his quiet humility are definitely worth a watch. Most of all, his intense love for his family. Early in their courtship, David rented a private plane and flew far away to see Posh for 15 minutes and flew back. The director of this film is Fisher Stevens, who actually, with spectacular storytelling and masterful editing, makes soccer almost interesting. Are you going to start waking up at 3 a.m. and driving to a pub to watch games no, with your cronies? No, I still don't care that much about okay. it. But as a, as a human being, he's a really interesting character and very likable and very humble. I mean, this dude was so big as a star during his peak time in England that he was the biggest guy in the planet. It was, And this is the beauty of documentary film is that you take a subject that you knew nothing about and that you didn't, you thought you did not care about and you learn it from a hu- on a human level and suddenly it's interesting. And yeah, that's all I, that, that is really all I care about. First of all, um, um, he, with, with the fame he had, the guy looks like, a, he looks like Brad Pitt, but even better. He's pretty perfect. He, he, uh, uh, but he's very humble. And, and he, all he cares about is his family and his two children. And it's, it's fantastic. I highly recommend it. Even if you don't like soccer, you're like me. I, I want to introduce Conchetta Tomei. Now, did I do that? <laughs> you did. We're so happy to introduce this very talented lady. You've seen her in films like Don't Tell Mama, The Babysitter's Dead, Out to Sea, The Muse, 20 Bucks, opposite Brendan Fraser, Purpose, opposite Mia Farrow. She was in TV series like China Beach, which was a wonderful show about the Vietnam War, Necessary Roughness, and Providence, which was on NBC, and I was forced to watch it even if I didn't want to. Because there it was. She had recurring roles on Murphy Brown, Wings, Picket Fences, L.A. Law, all kinds of stage credits as well, including on Broadway, where she did Cyrano opposite Kevin Klein, for my money, one of the great male actors in America, and The Elephant Man opposite David Bowie. Conchetta Tomei, we're so happy to have you here. Wow. Um I'm, I'm, I'm certainly... Uh, Do honest. any of these credits seem like they ref- <laughs> are they familiar to you at all? Yes, they're okay, all good. familiar to me. Yes, I've had... I have to uh, ask one question before we start. <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, so you're doing The Elephant Man with David <laughs> Bowie. Mm-hmm. So how is it to do a show with somebody who is a pre-described megastar in the world of rock and roll, and then you sort of had to blend into his white hot light every night and act. Was it a pleasant experience? It was a phenomenal experience, but I must say, um, and before I answer that question, I want to just say uh, thank you, um, Mr. Coleman, Louise, very, very much for for letting me be on the show, uh, asking me to be on the show. I'm very honored. And uh, we, are, we are so honored to have touched. you here. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't know, sorry, I had I can't answer your question in the way that you asked it because I didn't know who David Bowie was. Oh, that's even better. That's the best answer. <clears throat> yeah. So this was in 1980. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, when I was ca- I was already on Broadway in The Elephant Man for six months. Then I took over the Broadway National Tour, and that's when I met uh, David Bowie. Uh, Who did I worked he replace with Bowie in the role? For three, for three weeks, oh. um, uh, three months rather. I'm sorry, sorry. Who did he replace in the role? Uh, he replaced uh, Philip Anglim. Oh. I worked with five Elephant Men: Bruce Davison, uh, Jack Weatherall. Uh, Canadian actor, uh, Philip Anglim, who found the property in the bottom of this church at a little play in London uh, by Bernard Pomerantz. That's how the Elephant Man was discovered in this the bottom of a church, a little play. Give us a little background for folks who are not familiar with the title, what what the story is about and what the performer who portrays the Elephant Man has to, has to do on stage. Um, the Elephant Man is about John Merrick who had neurofibromatosis, I believe that's what it is. And uh, he was thrown into a circus because his parents just um, abandoned him. Because his face looks different, correct? It it was mangled. Mm -hmm. And not only the face, but the entire body was mangled. So he's in a lot of pain. All the time. All the time. And uh, so they put him in a freak show. And he was discovered there uh, in London years ago, John Merrick, and very bright, very bright. Nobody knew it because of the way he looked on the outside. That's why you cannot judge people by the way they look, Mm -hmm. you know, Uh, or even sometimes how they act or don't act. Uh, You have to just find out who they are within. Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Treves, um, who studied this, saw him, and um, it would <laughs> discovered him really, but he wanted to work with him, so he brought him to the hospital in in London, and he saved his life basically. And uh, John Mar- and David Bowie, you know, uh, went to London uh, to see um, uh, the church that the model uh, uh, that John Merrick did. I mean, Bowie did a lot of research, and the reason I said I didn't know Bowie, I, because I wasn't part of that world. I was part of, you know, the theater world, Broadway th- world, um, uh, not the rock world. Uh, but Bowie was a consummate actor, consummate actor, and a sweet, sweet man. It was a privilege to work with him, because there was no ego involved. Mm-hmm. So it goes on, but the actor who plays the elephant man, and as I say, Philip Anglin, uh, discovered the property, bought it, and then I worked with five different elephant men, if you can imagine that, and then David Bowie. Uh, he, um, the, the actor who plays the elephant man, who, whoever that actor is, and I thought uh, Bowie was by far the best wow. of the five that I worked with. Not that to demean any of the others, but there's something about Bowie's body that was so frail looking mm. and... Um, so available, hmm. so innocent, and so young. I was 33, David was 32. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to stay in this, this uh, pretzel-like position mm-hmm. for two and a half hours. With prosthetics? No prosthetics. No prosthetics. That's what's amazing. Okay. No makeup, no okay. prosthetics. Only uh, uh, what lo- would look like a diaper mm-hmm. around him, tied to the side. And um, nothing on the top, nothing on the bottom. And so he remains. And so in order for him to act, not to act, but to, you know, he had to stay in that position for two and a half hours, with the exception, of course, of intermission. It, it was a painful, it was painful thing to watch. It was in the eyes, wasn't it? Because he yes. had the two, it was, it was all in the eyes. All in the eyes. Yeah. And in his voice, the voice of a child. Mm-hmm. And there was intellect. And there was feeling, and there was emotion. And you play what in that story? Mrs. Kendall Mm -hmm. uh, was the actress, actually, who met uh, John Merrick, Um, supposedly, you know. um, She didn't spend an entire play with him, as the Elephant Man suggests. Uh, But everyone was pulled in by that. But she actually never met John Merrick, Mrs. Kendall. Wow. And she was a you know a great actress, you know in her day, and um, but they needed a leading lady, so you know 
she, they, she, they said that she was concerned about uh, uh, John Merrick, and she had known of him, but they had never really come together to meet face to face. Um, that's kind of, you know, that that's something for an actor to think about, an actress wow. who has to work, you know, I'm wondering, well, you have to create all of that. So a lot of that comes, you know, from being an actress yourself, myself, and a lot of it comes from what David gave to me and the other actors on stage, but mainly what David gave to me. And David was a generous generous so actor on that. stage. I wanted that to be the, he's such a creative person who yeah. was way ahead of his time way in the ahead. world of music and you could just tell that he's probably artistic in every facet of his life. And also, you know, a guy that you could actually live next door. I mean, he was like, I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Wisconsin and he was like somebody that all my Midwest buddies that I had known. I mean, just really down to earth and uh, very loving and very concerned. And he, w he asked me a question, Fritz, if I may call you that. Uh, that's the only thing I respond to. Okay. <laughs> well, I used to be, you know, <laughs> when I was raised, Mr. Coleman. Oh, um, but anyway, um, he would ask, he asked me a question one night. Uh, we were we rehearsed in New York first, and I, I met his little son, Zoe, when he was eight, mm -hmm. in 1980. Mm -hmm. And uh, then... Uh, we played, uh, we rehearsed in San Francisco, New York. We played, I played the Blackstone Theater in Chicago uh, for four weeks with him. I played the auditorium, which was a barn in Denver, unfortunately, because, and I don't mean to say that horribly, except it came out badly. Um, this is an intimate play, and the auditorium in it Denver, the stage the ceilings there. ceilings are too high. At, exactly. Yeah. Just too big. The sound mm -hmm. floats away. And the play was intimate. You know, and to it pull was everybody such a in. beautiful story, and the irony is that Mel Brooks went on to produce the movie. Yes, and that, and and one of Anthony Hopkins' great performances in that movie, and I just loved it. I thought it was a spectacular story. Yes, it was. Um, but however, they they had to say Mel Brooks had to say not from Bernard Pomerantz's play The Elephant mm. Man oh. because so much was changed mm. the and was not necessarily accurate mm -hmm. in a more film worthy than um fact worthy so but david um then we went chicago denver san francisco did new york and then after we've been rehearsing and playing uh together on stage performing he asked me uh, um after the performance he said you know you know love he said um <laughs> <clears throat> i thought oh God, if only I could be. Um, I was 33. He was 32. Mm -hmm. um, younger men. My husband is <laughs> younger as well. So I love young men. Anyway, my husband's now my age, but then will be not my age in two more months. Close <laughs> enough. Close enough. All right. So afterwards, he he said, you know, love, he said, you know, he said, um, I'm missing a... Um, I'm missing a moment on stage. And, you know, he had that Liverpool, Manchester accent, that working class Londoner accent, you know. And he said, he said, I know I'm missing a beat somewhere. Um, could you possibly, could we rehearse that scene so I could, you know, um, do it properly? I know I'm missing. I know I'm missing a moment. I almost, I was astounded. Astonished oh. because he was a consummate actor mm. on stage when he was with his rock and roll gigs. Right. Mm. But I mean, on stage, he was stage worthy, more than stage worthy, consummate actor and a generous one. So I said, Well, I said, Which one are you, uh, you know, you asking about? And he said, Well, you know, I shake your hand. He said, You know, I don't know. He said, oh, it gets me so, you know, um, angry. He said, because I know. I know I'm missing something there. So I said, well, they, he wants to shake her hand, Mrs. Kendall. Mm -hmm. And he can't get his arm because it's so uh, mm -hmm. frozen in time because of the neurofibromatosis. I mean, it's just really paralytic. Uh, he's frozen there. And um, so she dips down her hand mm. and lifts up his hand mm -hmm. to make it easier for her to shake his hand as she leaves. 
And probably he's really yearning for human touch. Yes. So there's something profound there that he wanted to find. His whole life was yearning for human touch. Right. It's a great, great, great statement. It's a big metaphor. Yes. And that's what David was looking for. Yes. And because, you know, when Anglum, who had known the play so well and and discovered it, found it, bought it, um, you know, there was always this moment that the audience would go, and Bowie must have seen that moment. I knew that moment existed. Mm -hmm. Um, But... It, it's it's a really profound moment. And I said, I think what you have to do, David, I said, don't ask me because I have no questions. This is my very first Broadway play mm-hmm. um, and my first time working with a rock star. So um, <laughs> if I said, I think your hand has to be a little, maybe an inch or two higher, s- lower sorry, lower, so I can scoop up, scoop up your hand. Mm -hmm. And it'll look like, you know, first you have, it's so hard for you to reach forward because you're in such pain, but you were dying to have that touch, as you said. Mm -hmm. So if it could be low, I can then reach down, scoop it up, and then we are both level we are both equal you are not the freak mm. i am not you just described it gave me goosebumps it mm. must have been like watching it on stage it was oh. quite beautiful and did that did that little did that work correction work yeah right so uh he did it the next night okay and it was in the first act and so he comes to my dressing room at intermission he said it worked, governor. <laughs> it worked, governor. <laughs> so wow. just, I mean, you know, he was a joy. He was just a joy. And if you've seen David, and, you know, especially at Conan, you know, O'Brien, and I, miss, I met Mr. O'Brien uh, at the Geffen Theater when I was uh, doing a play there and had a lovely time. And after David had passed away, you know, he, he had... Um, a special for him on his show. The show was just about David. Mm -hmm. And I remember him saying, you know, he was such a sweet man. And so I walked up to Mr. Uh, O'Brien. I said, Mr. O'Brien, I said, I'm sorry to bother you. I said, but I worked with, um, and it was intermission. I said, I worked with David Bowie in The Elephant Man. And that's exactly what he was. I had watched your show and you had said he was such a sweet man. And he was. Mm. He was such a sweet man. He said, I'll bet oh, that really? meant a lot to Conan, too. That's good. It was, it was a beautiful experience. And then, you know, he'd go out to drink with the cast. I mean, the limo picked him up after the show. Sure. And then some people, the stage managers, just flew in the limo with him. <laughs> but, you know, he would go out. Uh, I never did. Uh, but he would go out um, with the stage managers, some, some actors in the show, and they'd go have a glass of wine or whatever they did. But during rehearsal in San Francisco, I remember he said, you know, Conchata, come on, you've got to, you've got to have some fun. You, know, have a little you play an actress, here. you are an actress, come on. <laughs> so I said, all right. So I went, and it was just, he was sitting next to me and laughing. He had this wonderful laugh. He laughed from his soul. <laughs> wow. And that's how he worked. Mm. He worked from his soul mm-hmm. in his music. Wrote some amazing music way ahead of time. I want to add, can I just ask you about one more favorite of mine? And then you may of course. Give the rest of the show sure, to you. Sure, sure. Um, uh, Kevin Klein. To yes. me, is this, I always thought he was going to replace Cary Grant as the Cary Grant of our era. I just love him. What a talented, talented yeah, man. Absolutely. How was that in Syria? Well, I, um, I, I, that was the second time I worked with him. Oh. I, the very first time I worked with him as Queen Elizabeth, uh, opposite him playing Richard III at the Delacorte Theater, which is Shakespeare in the Park, Joe Papp, free theater. God bless Joe Papp, wherever you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, great producer, uh, great man. And uh, that was my very first role with Kevin in Shakespeare. I find, found Kevin to be... <laughs> so much fun. Mm. I mean, so much fun. And yet, so unbelievably disciplined. You know, uh, he would have people run lines for him off stage during rehearsals, you know. And then he'd have somebody at his home 
run lines for him after rehearsal. He was really disciplined. And the cast loved him. He loved working with actors. He loved what he did. He loved the stage. And and we loved him because of that. That love embraced all of us. Mm -hmm. Because Kevin never was the star, as was Bowie. They never played that star role, ever. And Bowie was a rock star. Kevin was a stage and Academy Award winner, Mm -hmm. you know? I always thought Kevin should be in more films and stuff. It just seems like he just only appears every once in a while. He did that great Cole Porter role in that movie that I've seen about 15 (gasps) times, and I just loved it, and I thought, why isn't this guy in more movies? I know. You know, I don't understand uh, a lot of what goes on in this business, Fritz, and how people see actors or actresses, uh, if they're going to be bringing in a lot of money for a film. If not, I mean, I worked, uh, you know, they're going to be, is there star quality? Well, Kevin Klein certainly has star quality. You walk in a room and the energy has changed. Uh, Bowie, the energy's changed. Dennehy, Brian Dennehy, mm. fabulous man. Adore Brian Dennehy, the dearly departed Brian Dennehy. Um, and also a man you could sit down, have a beer, glass of wine with next door neighbor, you know, no ego with Dennehy. And you sometimes wonder why Dennehy was always, you know, the second banana. And there was always this lead. He always he was with either Harrison Ford, who had all that. And Dennehy had the range. Kevin had the range, has the range. I think and I'll Guy- never understand the question that you just asked, what that answer is. Well, I think I know the answer. Tell, please tell me. Sure, I'll speak for those two guys. Not a problem. <laughs> I think there's just a lot more range in character acting. Kevin Klein has been the lead in like millions of films. He's certainly had the career I think he always aspired to, but he wants interesting roles. He doesn't want to be just that's a, what it is. a good be, looking be, leading man that kind of is one lane. And he likes all the lanes. He might be really choosy. He's very choosy and that's very intuitive. Mm-hmm. And you know it because that's exactly who he is. Mm-hmm. You know, um, he'll turn down roles unless they mean something to him. You're absolutely right. So, but, you know, I wish, I mean, when you thought, after Sophie's Choice, you would have thought, and then, you know, you're you're talking drama. I mean, it goes beyond drama. I mean, he lived that role, as did Meryl. Then you uh, look at him as the buffoon uh, in A Fish Called Wanda. The the guy can go... Great Both physical with, comedian, but absolutely. a great, like, super deep funny guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's actually a female Lucille Ball because he's, <laughs> you know, but a lot taller and um, really a lot of fun. I was very lucky. And Cyrano, the same thing. You know, the same thing with Cyrano. I mean, to watch this guy on stage, you can learn from Kevin Klein. You can this learn time, we, from. We the, have prosthetics here, right? Oh, that nose <laughs> that we gave away every night for you oh, know. Oh, you gave it away. <laughs> Did you really? Talk about that. <laughs> we didn't really. We auctioned that nose off. So oh, Kevin yeah, funny. would put, especially you know during the AIDS um, theater. Okay. You know AIDS uh, charity uh, event uh, that is you know wonderful in in on the stage in New York or anywhere in Chicago on stage, but the theater does that to raise money. Equity cares. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we (laughs) he would go on stage with his nose and then he'd take it off. It was just... uh, At the end of the show when it was all over, he'd come out and auction it off? No, uh, at the end of the show, yeah, he would would be there, yeah, Uh, with the nose on and he'd take it off. I mean, it was just his... His sense of humor is fast. So, how many of those noses are on fireplaces across the across the globe? Well, you know, it was just auctioned. One equity cares. It's only once a year. I think it went for like two grand. So if you're I saying remember. only one nose was only locked. one nose went. Oh, I thought every See, we night only he did it ten weeks, and oh, okay. we happened to do it during the equity cares charity event time. Right, which so is November to perfectly. to Christmas. Yes, then we went on strike. Hello. You know, the yeah. Iatsi, the crews struck, so we all went. Oh, I see. Because um, the actors and the crews, they, they support each other, but just fun. I think when you're talking about acting, and I, I know very little about it, believe me, I do. I'm oh, still. Stop it. No, no, I'm still learning so much because there's so much to learn. Um, I think the actors that I have worked with, that I have really revered, uh, have all been. Very intelligent. Very, Very intelligent. I, I want to hear some of the ones that really changed your life when you worked with them. Uh, well, Dennehy. 
Dennehy's smart, was smart, fast, uh, well-read. Um, you know, Cormac McCarthy, the Irish writer, was his one of his favorite authors, and he named his son, uh, his adopted son, Cormac. Mm. You know, uh, uh, the um, let's see. Uh, all right, smart, smart actors. Uh, William Daniels. Uh, I never worked with William Daniels, but I did work with um, Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau. Oh, I want to hear about now, that. Now, smart, I mean smart, fast, quick, kind, kind, very kind. What did you do with those guys? I did Out to Sea at the Raleigh Studios, and Ooh. I was able to dance with Donald O'Connor. Wow. Uh, my, Steve Lamana, who I'm giving a shout out, because if it wasn't for Steve Lamana, who's not only my agent, but he's like my brother and a very good, good friend. I know his mom and I knew his father. So, hey, Steve, thanks for this. He's the reason I'm here, and you are, of course. But he got all this done, and thank you, Dina, for always being on that email <laughs> you know, getting our attention because Laman is the chairman of the board over at Innovative. Um, Sinatra never died. So um, <laughs> Lemon and Mathau, um, <clears throat> Lemon and Mathau, <laughs> just, they'd crack each other up, mm -hmm. except Lemon couldn't, t couldn't keep a straight face with math. I mean, all you have to do it's is look hard. at a rubber face. I mean, it's Mr. Mathau had this rubber foil, this kind of, you know, um, that crazy glue, not crazy glue, cra crazy, um, what do you Silly putty. Oh, thank you, darling. Mm. Silly putty face. <laughs> yes. I'm a boomer child. So all you do is sit there, and they're doing a scene. I, was, I saw it. I saw it. I thought, this can't be happening. And I thought, how wonderful, because you know what? It made them like me. I was, I thought, my gosh, they're people. Isn't that nice? Mm. They're just down to earth. So they made Everyone on the set comfortable. They had known each other for a hundred years, and then they embraced all of us in that friendship and all of that talent with us on that studio set. But that brings out the best in everyone because mm -hmm. you're right. When you, when you feel safe and you feel loved, you you, you try things. Well, um, let me tell you, mm -hmm. when they were doing a scene, they'd have to say cut, cut between Matha and Lemon, because Lemon couldn't keep a straight face. <laughs> Harvey Corman. Look, I mean, this is a guy, a friend of his for many, many years, mm -hmm. you know, off stage, on stage, off camera, on camera. He knows Mathau. He looks at him, Mathau does the reading of a line, and he can't come back. Cut, cut. It's I'm like honestly, Jack Benny and George Burns. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you can, and there's some people like, and even, you know, um, Olivier, I read uh, uh, that he's easy. He goes up easily. You cannot do anything funny on stage because Olivier, even though uh, you know he has the concentration, or had the concentration of Spencer Tracy, and nobody had better concentration than Tracy on a stage. You could drive a rider truck through the stage. He'd pick up. He wouldn't even know it went through. And uh, Olivier the same way. However, the thing different between Olivier and Tracy is, Gilgood said, you know, Larry, you know, Larry just, you know, <laughs> he could get laughing so easily on stage. Oh, and we had great fun with Larry. <laughs> I mean, we're talking, you know, Lear, Othello, all these oh things. You don't want to be laughing, you know, doing uh, iambic pentameter, then try to find to <laughs> pick up, you know, the beat, so yeah. to speak. But that kind of... Um, and they were all well. I mean, when you think how talented uh, a lot of these actors are, I mean, Lemon played the piano. Uh, uh, concert. Yes. Uh, and mm -hmm. Kevin Klein. Mm -hmm. Concert. Mm -hmm. I mean, he played it for me during rehearsal. He'd go there to relax during uh, Cyrano and he, uh, during Richard, actually. And he just went on to the piano. And I thought, oh, these people, they're not only talented in there, they just like all parts of the arts mm -hmm. and then they're very socially conscious mm. they're conscious of giving money to those people that need it 
mentally ill people, well, maybe. homeless people, you know, people that really can't make it. They'll show up for a benefit for somebody who says, you know, we have a, long, a small theater in um, Dallas, Fort Worth. Could you mind being a guest there? Well, is it possible Kevin that... Kevin and I went. Is it possible that empathy is required of acting? I think so. It has to be. And so... It has to be. It just makes your heart full. Yes. And you you are able to easily relate to others who aren't you, who aren't in your particular right. circumstances, who are in their own circumstances, and you, you've portrayed them. So why wouldn't you help them? I th- that's, that's beautiful, Louisa. I think um, it can't be about you. Right. It can't be about the actor acting. So when you were back at the University of Wisconsin, oh, and, yes. and, and you knew from a very young age that you wanted to act, who were your signposts? Who were the oh. North Stars for you? Who did you say, God, if I could have their career? Well, uh, my signpost was Betty Davis, because I thought Davis could do it all, mm-hmm. could do it all. And, uh, of course, Hepburn, you know, uh, but a very different type of talent. Um, Ingrid Bergman uh, was a, a, a oh, wow. Um, Simone Signore, what a wonderful actress mm-hmm. she was. Yeah. Uh, Fonda, Jane Fonda was great in right. everything she mm-hmm. did, still is. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the waterfront, Help Me Fritz, opposite Brando, the woman who played on the waterfront. Uh, Eve Saint Marie. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Eve, Marie, Eve, Marie, Eve Marie, Marie Saint. Eva Marie Saint. Yes. Okay. That was my decent life. Thank you. Eva Marie Saint. Another great actress. Mm-hmm. You know, Eva Gardner. Oh. So wow. two questions. Do you think your Midwestern upbringing gives you a sort of a sense of the soul of Americans and made you a better performer? Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt. And then you, you you went to University of Wisconsin. Then you went to the Goodman Theater in Chicago. And, and I mean, Chicago's got some spectacular theater. Fabulous. Steppenwolf, Second City, all yep. these great things. So you really came up in the... That was probably ground zero for some of the greatest theater in America. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, talk, talk about that experience. Well, you know, before I uh, went to Chicago uh, or New York, um, I taught school. My, my, you know, was Bachelor of Science in Education, minor in Communication, Liberal Arts. And I taught 7th and 8th grade uh, English and Social Studies in Wisconsin for four years. Then went to Art Institute, Goodman School of Drama. And, you know, Steppenwolf hadn't started until I graduated. And I was so upset. But I was so great that it was I I was so lucky to be able to be on Space Force with Steve Carell and John Malkovich because Malkovich started he was the, the one of the founders of Steppenwolf in mm-hmm. Chicago yeah. in Chicago great theater in Chicago Gary Sinise Gary uh, Sinise another one mm-hmm. wonderful uh, wonderful man I met uh, him many many times uh, Joy Mantegna uh, uh, one went, of the nicest people in show business isn't he yep I, 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 I can call him my friend. He lives in Toluca Lake, as do I. Oh, I just love him. He, I have a picture that we took together because he went to the Art Institute and mm-hmm. Goodman School of Drama. Mm-hmm. I have to, if I may. Please. Joey, this is the funniest thing I have ever heard <laughs> in my life. And, of course, it came from him. We, there was a, a, a mutual friend that built my mom and dad's guest house here with uh, my beloved husband, Norman Moltar, behind our house because I brought my mom and dad from Kenosha, Wisconsin. I didn't want my dad to shovel snow anymore. (laughs) I wanted him to plant his gardens, to do his artwork, to uh, follow his own dream because he helped me to follow mine. Oh, bless your heart. So nice. So by the grace of God, television money, theater money, as much as I love theater, television money. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> built the guest house. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, the real Providence, you know, mm. built that guest house. <laughs> so um, anyway, the contractor who did my guest house also did a number of Mr. Mantegna's hole. Mm-hmm. And we go, I, I always knew him as Joey, but I will refer to him as Joe. Can I call him so Joey? So we go to this contractor, 75th birthday party in the valley, and we have, it's at this lodge or whatever and i walk in i did not know joe would be invited i'm 
I didn't ever thought. I just thought, well, my husband's good friend is Nick Politis, and he's another maritime attorney, uh, as my husband was. And uh, he was related to the contractor, Dave Hansen. So the moment we walk in, you know, I hear, Conchata, Conchata. And I thought, who the heck? And it's Joy Mantegna, <laughs> Aunt Mantegna, in the round table, one of his tables. The room was filled. And I said, Conchetta, Conchetta. <laughs> it was a cross between Chicago and New York, but it was definitely Sicilian because that's who he, this guy is. Um, <clears throat> so I said, Joe, Joey. And I said, you know, so I go over to him. He said, hey, he said, I just saw Vinny and whatever. So he said, come on, you got to sit at our table. So Norman and I sat at the table. I hadn't seen Joey in years. And uh, a lot of mutual friends who had our same drama teacher, Dr. Bell Itkin. Um, her father was David Itkin and studied with Stanislavski in Russia. I mean, it goes so far, so many stories. So <laughs> he's telling the story. We're talking about, we're talking about actors. We're talking about our parents. We're talking about <laughs> all these funny things. And you know, because um, my mother said, "Listen, if that acting gig doesn't work, you have." <laughs> Got to go back to teaching because that's why we paid all that money for four years at the the Big Ten University. So Joey's mother had sort of the same thing in mind. And she was very, very concerned. And she said, I'm worried about you. You know, do you need any money? True story. Wow. I'm worried about you, Joe. Do you oh. need any money? And he said, Ma, what are you talking about? I'm on television. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, I know. But you work one hour a week. <laughs> That's funny. I have a Joe Montana story really quick. Please. Remember when the Apple store was a new thing in the mall? And yes. you could walk in and they had those big tables mm -hmm. and they had an iPad on it for the very first time ever. I'm in there, Fritzy, with, with Ian, with Ian Broyles, our, who was our doing tech, tech for uh, Fritzy's play. We're, we're at that big table and there's an iPad, the first iPad ever. On the other side of the table, we both spot Joe Montana. And Ian, the giant brain whiz child that he is, starts tapping on the iPad, Googles Joe Montaigne, so that we're looking at Joe Montaigne on the screen and on the other side of the table. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. That is a fabulous He's just the loveliest story. man. And he used to own this he great fast food man. restaurant called Taste Chicago. Yes, I know. At the I corner had, of I Hollywood Way and Magnolia. Yeah, and I, I would, at there. least three or four nights a week, I would stop there for would takeout because they had the best lasagna and pizza and sandwiches. And then they went out of business because his wife ran that restaurant. And after yes. a while, it, it just became too big. Arlene. But he's just a good man. And he has a, um, two beautiful daughters, Mia and yes, Gia. Yes. And boy, aren't those. From this moment forward, please rhyme your kids' names. It's <laughs> adorable. Right, right. And please call them Italian names. Sure. Like Congetta or Mia or Gia or Sofia. Because <laughs> it's good calm, it's good angry, it has all the notes, right? Yep. right. It has how, all did, the notes. Uh, how did you make the transition from uh, theater in Chicago to New York? That's a wonderful question. I never thought about it. Well, I just thought... I'll ask another question. What great... <laughs> it's a terrible thing, you know. I, I, I don't know if it was my age, and I didn't start... You know, as I was 18. I didn't hit the streets anymore. You New were York. a teacher for four years. I was a teacher for four years. I went to drama school when I was 26. I graduated at 29. I, went, I hit New York when I was... And, but I did Chicago theater first. Then I hit New York when I was 33, were you and cast then I hit for New California, York Los Angeles television when I was 40. Mm. Were so you I cast, had a late start. Were you cast for New York out of your work in Chicago, or did you just go and take a chance in the Big Apple? No, what happened was um, I was cast. Oh, no, you're talking about that. I jumped with no net, but I had a net. My background, my childhood, my values, my belief in God, mm -hmm. uh, my mother and father. Talk about your parents. Um, so there was a net. There was a net of love. Uh, so I that's never. All you need, really. I was. Ne that's all you need. And I, I never was <clears throat> frightened about that. I, I just there was no fear at that time. Mm. You know, I got to New York when I was thirty-three, not when I was eighteen. I just landed. But tell us about your parents. Who who were they? My mother uh, was Dominica. Uh, what a beautiful name. Britelli. Uh, B R I T T E L L I, and um, my father was Henry Tomei, 
and uh, my father's people were from Rome, mm. and my mother's people were from Calabria, as is Steve Lamana, my agent. Calabria. Yes, he, he was from Reggio. My mother, my grandmother Congetta, or Conchetta, uh, was from Cosenza, and my grandfather Gaetano, my mom's dad, was from Catanzaro. And it's uh, Provincia de Rocca Bernard, the provin- province of uh, uh, Rocca Bernard. And he was a shepherd, um, you know, herding sheep uh, back in Italy. Is that your father or your grandfather? That was my grandfather. Wow. Yeah, my grandfather, Gaetano. That was on my mother's side. Mm-hmm. And then um, my T- Tome, they landed in, um, they came uh, from Italy and landed in Michigan, you know, and my father, my grandfather, my mother's parents, uh, landed in Kenosha, Wisconsin, because he came in the summer. Little did he know what was going to happen in December. Oh my We're goodness. only 50 miles from Chicago. He thought, oh, mm-hmm. bellissima, Calabria, <laughs> yeah. summer. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, it was winter, yeah. right. you know, in December. But it didn't make any difference. They were so happy to be in this country. They were proud to be in this country. Mm-hmm. And all of uh, that background, that history, that tradition, because I'm named after my mother's mother, uh, Conchetta, mm-hmm. um, I carry with me everywhere I go. You know, I, n- I never saw uh, my grandfather uh, ever not take his hat off In the company of a lady. When the American flag. Oh, okay. That's wonderful. When the American flag passed by on the Mm -hmm. 4th of July. Mm -hmm. He knew what it meant because he had lived through fascism. Yeah. I've always said that immigrants appreciate what we have in this country more than people that were born and raised in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Absolutely. They really do. They They have no idea. And these people that are fighting against democracy (sighs) right now have no idea. Go talk to somebody that was in Berlin in 1935 or someplace else. That's right. They have no idea. Absolutely none. Or lived in those, or or lived in Auschwitz. Yes. Died there. How was your father employed? My father was a policeman. Oh. And he was a great cop. Uh, because he believed to protect and to serve. He lived his life like that. Mm. Um, so you felt protected? Always. Yeah. Did you, uh, were they supportive of your uh, theatrical? I wouldn't be dis- sitting here, Fritz, if it wasn't for yeah. Henry and Dominica Tomei. Would not be sitting here. I think they've prepared you for the game that we're about to play, which is called... <laughs> oh, boy. Which is, this is what the American dream was meant to <laughs> was meant to inspire. This game is called IMDB Roulette. I mention a credit, and you tell us who you played and what you remember about the experience. All right. All right, so let's begin with Dynasty. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, good answer. Woo, Joni. Joni Collins. So she, she was a fireball, huh? Yeah, he, she sure is. She sure was. <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember who you played? Uh, I, I, it was a guest star, mm-hmm. uh, a very short scene, only one scene. Oh. Yes. Uh, and, but when I had, <laughs> Lordy, that's, that was actually the very first <clears throat> television thing I had done. Wow. When I came here, because I came from The Normal Heart. I had done The Normal Heart with Brad Davis, Larry Kramer's great play uh, about the gay men's health crisis. Mm -hmm. And so when I landed here, the very, you know, I did theater here. And then my very first role was on Dynasty. Then the second one was Falcon Crest. Those were two of those soaps. But I had never been on a sound set before. So I arrive at CBS Radford, and there's this. You know, sound stage, they're all numbered. I have so much to learn. And then I thought, my gosh, don't, you'll, you'll remember it all. Just know that you're living the dream because <laughs> your mom and dad opened that door, mm. opened that magical door to walk into the, you know, into that, that garden of beauty with learning so much from so many people and then being able to give back whatever talent you had to share it all. Mm-hmm. So it always keeps going forward and uh so i'm 
walk into the I walk into the set. I don't know if it was twenty five. The sound stage. I open the door. I said, "Is anybody here?" <laughs> Cut. <laughs> that's it, Fritz. Oh, oh seriously? Cut. Oh, that's funny. Oh my God. It was a little too quiet. So, and then, and then I heard Miss Collins say, "Who did that?" Uh oh. Who's on this stage? So what I did was. I ran around <laughs> trying to find a hiding place on that set. Seriously. It was embarrassing. It was really embarrassing. No one found me. And I never said, I'm sorry. I never said, it was me, because I heard her voice and I thought, Alexis, you're going to go up against today. Alexis yeah. on Dynasty? I don't think so, Conchetta. You no, know, wigs will fly. No, no. She was, um, she was a very, she was as tiny is it could be she was like this little butterfly very small woman woman but very powerful mighty and then years later i had heard someone say because i'd never watched any of these programs uh, i did only one episode but with uh, morgan fairchild the wonderful morgan fairchild i did six on falcon crest only one with miss collins but they said conchetta there was not one episode in dynasty that anyone went up, guest star, whatever, against Alexis. You were the only guest star there that went up against her character. So to My character did, because I'm, you know, as you may have guessed, I'm pretty, I'm strong and I'm very proud of being a strong Italian-American and a woman, yay women, um, yay strong men too. What was um, the scenario of you going up against her character? The scenario was I didn't agree with anything that she said in the scene. And she was getting more pissed off, excuse me. Uh, she was getting more upset because it was written like that. Mm -hmm. And she, for some reason, didn't wasn't aware of that. She didn't think somebody would go to bat with her. She I didn't want to be challenged. She didn't. That's it. That's exactly it. And uh, but I was doing I was I had a memorized script. It's not like I was saying but it was the Joan, role. I don't oh like God. you, I don't like your character. <laughs> the, yeah. I'm speaking for the and, audience. Yes, <laughs> and that's why I opened the door and the you know, you can't open anywhere. And that red light goes on those sound stages, it's absolute silence. The mm. mice, the mice and the rats stop. They mm. don't even <laughs> run around anymore. <laughs> so um uh, yeah, in that regard, yeah, she didn't like being challenged. And that was the word, actually. Interestingly, you should say that. You're terrific. Thank you. Um, uh, that was the word that they used. Alexis, nobody challenges Alexis on Dynasty. No one can shut up. I said, well, all I did, I memorized the lines. I <laughs> well, she was in, starting to believe I, her own mythology. That's kind of sad, really. Yes. Oh, yes. my God. Yes. But I, I did. There was one funny thing that... I heard her say years ago, uh, just actually two, um, <laughs> very funny. And, um, you know, she's now Dame, Dame Collins. Okay. Oh, right? man, that's all she needed. Can you imagine? <laughs> no. And um, That's all she needed. <laughs> that's all she needed. And she got it. <laughs> and so um, there, it's a, it, they go on and on, as we know, about Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. And <laughs> she was interfered, and she said, oh, my God. God, are these, are these, are these people still breathing oxygen? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was brilliant, that <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe she's nicer than I thought she was. Maybe I misjudged her. Hmm. She had a great sense of humor, but uh, I never saw it. Maybe she's. Mellowing. I didn't mess around, you know. I, no, and no, I, and I wasn't asked back. That character. Oh. Well, I was not asked back. But what's interesting is the producers liked you because you go on to do number two in IMDb Roulette, Falcon Crest. Oh, yes. Six. So tell us who you played there. Well, I played a psychiatrist with Morgan, and uh, they had three episodes planned. And I thought, isn't that wonderful? You know, three episodes. Now I can buy a car. Because <laughs> uh, I had... Um, Three thousand dollars saved, and the Volvo that I wanted to buy, the nineteen eighty Volvo, uh, was six thousand dollars. Oh! So I had three episodes of Falcon Crest, and I might—I'll just say it—they gave me a thousand dollars a week. I thought I had 
died and gone to heaven. And apparently the storyline, because Morgan was, you know, wandering around in the brothel district. She didn't know where she was going. We're telling, I mean, this is soap, ladies. This is soap. We live this. But there, there's also stuff still on television like that. <laughs> Sometimes we often live these soap operas. So she's walking around aimlessly. She doesn't know what's happening. And, um, and but she was abused. Mm. She was abused, mm-hmm. um, I think, by her dad. And um, so she had so many things. Well, the fan mail that came in because of all of the women that were abused by either their uncles or their fathers uh, or their teachers mm-hmm. or a family member, mm-hmm. it was unbelievable. It was like as if Bowie had guest starred, seriously. <laughs> so okay. they then gave three more episodes. They wrote three more, so I got six. And you were a, a doctor. thousand dollars an episode. Wow. I was able to buy so my Volvo for six thousand dollars. And you played Doctor Estelle Kramer. So you yes. you were someone that was helping her. Yes, okay. I was the psych- her psychologist. Okay, and we would sit together, and. Uh, These another days, sweetheart of a of an actress, mm-hmm. sweetheart know, of a I human played, being. I played. Uh, I was on a Bob Hope special, <gasps> and she and uh, really? and Tony Randall played oh. Brooke Shields' parents, and I was dating Brooke Shields at the time. Oh, and she played I the played mom, her mother. She, she was very, very. Lovely. I need to watch this episode of Bob. I mean, you're talking uh, I'm telling about. You, they, yeah, they're still talking Emmy. Oh, they're Emmy hauntings. Still <gasps> so much buzz. So much buzz. Now, I let mean, me but ask Brooke you Shields and so, Christina Applegate, all these. You know, these children that had these really controlling mothers, oh, yeah. as did Judy Garland. Yeah. Judy yes. Garland's mother was a monster, mm-hmm. apparently. Mm-hmm. And so was the studio head. Yes, they oh. certainly Louis B. Were. Mayer is the one that got her on drugs to keep her awake to shoot movies. That's right. Yeah. Or to keep her, or to keep her th- the entire autobiography of Louis B. Mayer. Yeah, wow. to keep her thin. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, and to keep her hyper 12. and keep her going she's those She's trying to go through hours, puberty, you guys. Terrible. Stop it. It's just terrible. Absolutely. So, puberty. I, I've only known you for two hours, but you. But, but what I'm certain <laughs> feels uh, like a lifetime, right? No, Fitzy? no. I, I, you have such a, a, a warm heart. <laughs> you, you really exude love. You really do, and so that explains to me why you have a pet um, area of, of philanthropy, which is pets. And talk about working with pet adoption and pet rescue. Well, before and, she does that, Fritz, uh-oh. you have to at least bookmark IMDb Roulette because oh, I'm sorry, we've only done one and two. Oh, okay. Well, I was just thinking. I was thinking in terms of time. So, well, let's do it's seven thirty. All right, I'm going to say the name. Okay, so here, <laughs> this is going to be this is going to be where you get to pick. I have. I'm sorry. Four more, but you get to pick one. I built up to that beautiful emotional thing, and she submarined that sucker. Yeah, it really did. Give me time to wipe away. Torpedo. All right, right. so you can either talk about uh, Diagnosis Murder, Ellen, Star Trek Voyager, or Arrested Development. How do we choose? Do any of those shows ring a bell? I could talk about all of them, but Diagnosis Murder... Well, we can have you back. Dick Van oh, Dyke. Please. Lovely man. Please. Yep. Yep. I mean. Yes. Seriously. I mean, all of his pratfalls. He does yoga to this very day. Yeah. But even during autopsies, he's doing pratfalls. Is that? No, no. He said okay. that the reason he does yoga, he said, okay. is because of all of the many pratfalls that he did. Okay. Prat, you know, pratfalls that he did, um, because talk about a physical actor in all of um, Mary Poppins. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dick Van Dyke show. Mm-hmm. And But, I mean, just Oh my God! Talk no, about a barrel man. of clowns talking yeah. like opening the door of a clown car. Yeah. That's like working with Dick Van Dyke. Yeah. So he likes to stay with you, and he and he loves to talk and visit and find out who you are. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. What were the other ones, really quickly? So we had Ellen. You were on Ellen. You you had a you? lot of doctors, professors with diagnosis murder with Dick Van Dyke. You were Sister Regina. I know. I was impressive. a hit woman. I loved you it. You were a minister on Star Trek Voyager, Minister I Odala. I was Minister Odala. I was in charge of the fourth quadrant. You often have a title. <laughs> wow. They give you a title. In charge of the fourth quadrant. Let's talk about that. Uh, Miss Minister Odala. Oh, wow. <laughs> and... Sorry, this is a plug, but Matthew Kaplowitz is as generous and as lovely as you both are 
as host and hostess. How is that possible? Oh. We're pretty and good. <laughs> I love that sense of humor. Oh, my God. A little snark in you. Now, I don't want to suck the life out of this whole conversation, but no. who is Matthew Kaplowitz? Well, that's what I'm about to tell you. Fritzy, that's what I'm about to tell oh, okay. you. okay. I'm sorry. All right. He does a podcast okay. called Trek Untold. Oh, my gosh. Yes. So, and he wanted to interview me. Perfect. Because of Minister Odala. He's a Trekkie. Well, I've heard there's Star Trek enthusiasts. Is, oh, is that my. not the case? Gosh, and I only did one. <laughs> what? Star, yes, and I only did one Star Trek. I did the Voyager, only but, one. But Minister Odala, nobody forgot her because wow. she was. And the reason I did it, I had to audition. Many of the roles that I've done for any actor listening or actress listening and younger than myself, because I'm sure all of you are, you have to just. Believe in yourself and prep really as much as you can and expect the unexpected and just have fun. Mm -hmm. Have fun and be so grateful that the universe and all of these things that came into play brought you where to you get are you at a this Volvo. moment. Yes. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. There it is and, right there. And, and the Voyager was a Shakespearean role. I had done four Shakespeare yeah. plays. Really? You know, I had done um, Beatrice and Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, I had done um, I had done Richard Shakespeare III in the with park? Kevin. In the Shakespeare in the Park. This was the Chicago Theater. Oh. Uh, Much Ado About Nothing, Beatrice. Uh, and then I did um, Cyrano de Berge. I mean, Richard the Third, uh, I did. Oh, two gentlemen of Verona. Oh, and um, <laughs> honey, do you remember the fourth? How, how is that's that? Great. That that's got to be so intimidating because the language does not flow off the tongue swimmingly. You have to really, you have to parse every sentence and know what the emotion is of what you're saying, and it's hard to figure out what you're saying in some of those. Things. And then try to go up and try to. If you go up and you cannot remember a line, Ooh. try to get back I, into iambic pentameter. Yeah, but, you just know, can't you have, live your way through You it. have to say, just like with Odala on um, Star, Trek, Star Trek Voyager, I love that the largest or the largesse of it all. And she was, a, it was like doing a Shakespearean role. It was tougher than heck because you had a 4.30 call time. You met Michael Blakemore who did my makeup for five hours, 4.30 a.m., 9.30. Then you work from 9.30 until 9.30 at night. It was a 12-hour day. And then you would put these huge, she was serpentine character, okay? Oh. Serpentine character. So you had to go to an ophthalmologist and get these big, huge contacts. I had never worn contacts in my life, wow. but they covered the entire oh. eyeball. Did that hurt? Oh, 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 oh. Wow. yes. And wh where was this shot? Wh what's and the, what's uh, Paramount, oh. Paramount mm -hmm. Studios. Um, so uh, th that larger than life, uh, those larger than life characters, and Shakespeare, getting back to that, uh, Fritz, Shakespeare gives it to you. Mm -hmm. He gives you all of it. Mm -hmm. All you have to do, it, it, it helps if you love poetry. Mm -hmm. it, lo it helps if you love to act. Mm -hmm. it, lo it helps if you love to be grandiose and comedic. Mm. And, and have a good voice. Dying, you know, you love to be dying on stage mm. um, or off. Um, Somebody that, told me that the way to uh, appreciate it, even if you don't understand Eliz yes. Elizabethan English, is if you watch the acting, you'll get what they're saying, Absolutely. even if you don't understand every word. Well, that's because Shakespeare gives it to you. In that iambic pentameter, uh, you know, if you stick to the iambic pentameter, you stick to the dialogue, you stay in the play. It's music. All of us, it's music. It becomes an opera. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then it informs your character mm -hmm. as to what to do. I mean, I thought, oh, my God, iambic pentameter. But, see, I love poetry. Mm. And, you know, that, you know, eight beats, eight counts to the sentence and all of that. I, I found that fascinating. And the rhythm probably helps you to remember the lines. Yes, absolutely. Wow. But Shakespeare gives it all. He gives yeah. you he gives you the emotion. He gives you 
uh, the intention. He t- gives you even the subtext. I mean, talk about a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant playwright, whoever he was, because people believe Ben Johnson mm-hmm. may have been done all those plays. Well, there's freedom within boundaries. So yes, once there is. you know, it's a beautiful this thing is to the say. template. It's absolutely true. Boy, you can just go for it. Yep. Can we talk about animals now? Oh, yes, yes Fritzy. please. And I, is that Mark Ruffalo? No, it isn't. Because oh. I work with... Mark is also from my hometown. He's from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Which picture are you pointing work. to? Very, very environmentally oriented guy. Yes, I like very him so environmentally oriented. Are you pointing oriented. to yeah. uh, Jerry Mathers? Yeah. Yeah, that's the beaver. Isn't that nice? He and came over with his mom. That was... When you were reading about that and saying his mom did a good job oh, she's raising in. him, oh. I have said that to so many people mm. that... I mean, we're talking about teller at the bank mm. or somebody that's waiting at Gelson's with me. And that's and your helping, compliment? The real you know, lovely family. I said, you know, you, you had a good mother. You were really raised well. Uh, and the great thing about that interview was if he didn't feel like answering a question, he would simply glance over at his mother and his mother would do a 10-minute diatribe about the question I had just asked. She would, knew everything. Every, oh, sure. I mean, she knew every piece of trivia about his start in show business. It was fantastic. He but, would often say, you know, I was seven. Mom, do you remember when No, exactly. Yeah, it's totally understandable. But a good point. My yeah. mother said, Conchetta, I don't know about this boy character. He wears a dress. I want you to be able to wear that beautiful dress as Mrs. Kendall. He should not be married. Well, you know, it was Ziggy Stardust. Sure. He, he did all of these things. He had all of these costumes. I said, no, mother. That sounds like a mom. That is a, that's a mom. That's a that's, Midwest but mom. But that's a mom. But... You have to wear the dress. You've got to wear that beautiful dress, Holly. You've got to wear it. Holly's my middle name. Haven't we all, like in our time spans here on Earth, being here during such an interesting era, haven't we learned so much about the gender spectrums? Oh, huge. And that everyone should dress how you feel. Absolutely. Another world, really. Mm Mm-hmm. But another place People to can't exp- see that I'm wearing culottes right now. <laughs> Fetching. We, it's, it's important that we explore those worlds. Yeah. If Whatever they are, whether you agree, whether you disagree, it's really important to explore them and to have the patience with them. And there was a long time where the stage was the only place that yep. a person, let's take drag shows, for example, where a person could had the freedom to be who they felt like they were because it was in a show. So shows saved a lot of people's lives. Oh, yes. I I'm, had a I'm drag certain. queen uh, do my hair, put it in you know, all these little uh, pin curls when I was doing Tommy Toon's Cloud Nine off-Broadway oh. oh. with Jalko Ivanik, uh, who worked with Taylor Leone on Madam Secretary. Uh, he was only 24 years old in New York, Tommy Toon. And, uh, oh, my God, I just loved him. He was just wonderful. Yet, you know, he came in jeans, a top, whatever. He was, well, then when you went to see the drag queen show that he did right brilliant Mm -hmm. i said when i had never seen him so when i came back to the theater that night i just looked up to him he was doing pin curls under my i said you're (laughs) a great actor you're a great (laughs) actor what are you doing my pin curls for (laughs) um but i you know diversification absolutely i've just had so much fun Being able to follow the dream. And Mm -hmm. if it wasn't for my mother and father and that kind of generosity, if it wasn't for my husband's generosity, who lets me do whatever I want to do, especially what I love to do. Mm -hmm. If I'm not there to make lunch and I have a matinee, no big deal. That's one thing he never did was change who I was. Now, you have met Norman. Yes. He has a decaffeinated personality. I have a, ca- I have a leaded Norman's personality. Norman's awesome. He looks like he could be a, a movie star himself. He's quite a handsome man. <laughs> he is a handsome man. And anybody man. that understands maritime law is on another planet. He let's is. Face it. USC graduate, maritime law. One it has of the to be a planet with water, law. though, Fritz. So if I had a sailboat and somebody stole the name that I had <laughs> on the back of the sailboat, I would call you. We would love to know the most interesting maritime case. Well, one of his cases was um, John Paul Getty. What? No, oh, well. no one. Howard, Howard Hughes. Hughes. Oh, Howard Hughes. He was Ooh. one. Of, there was a number of attorneys. Mm-hmm. Norman was one of them. Wow. 
And I mean, so the poor go- guy lost. Can we Google Norman? I mean, it was, no, you can't, unfortunately, but he said uh, Howard Hughes was. Nuts. Impossible. This was toward the end of his I life mean, when he was looked like Bigfoot with his this long poor nails man, on him. You know, but he never uh, got the mental health care that he would have mm-hmm. needed. No, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. And that's what's so important to have done. But I mean, Norman has uh, an unbelievable background. Um, he should be sitting here as well. Very smart. I told him to do a podcast with him. He's, had, he's written you know, pilots and all kinds of stuff. Yep. So, Fritz, yeah. I'm so eager for you to get back to the animals no, and, and no. Betty oh, White. It's too late now. <laughs> We're going to save that for the next time we have her back. <laughs> <laughs> when they do the well, Elephant Man 2, we'll have a It her would back. be my honor and my pleasure, and it would move me deeply if I did come back. Oh. So anytime you want oh, me no, to come back. Oh, no, you're not back, getting out of here that easy. I we're going to talk about animals, back. and we're not letting you out oh, of here. all right, all right. And, and you're remember, coming back. And you're coming dog back. Dog spelled backwards is God. Oh, no, that's true. I, I did know that. they give you unconditional love. And I did, it didn't come from me. It came to somebody that, from someone that told me years and years ago, I thought, you know, I never thought about it. That, uh, that kind of unconditional love, you see it in the eyes mm. and in the tail, and how happy they are to see you. Even if you go away for two hours to a lunch, and you come back it's like you went to afghanistan and they really oh my god they're back home and they really know you yes they do and very psychic too i like them because they're non-judgmental the only relationship i've ever had in my life that worked is the one with my golden retriever really yes so you, you and say I, something like that, and I can't ask you why didn't it no, work. No, no, All right, no, but no, we no. Oh, there's a lot. He's written entire plays about this. No. Oh, uh, so, yeah. Uh, well, if you write a play, another one. Please, I will audition for it. Ooh. Well, it's a one-person play. However, no, you I was well, honored to have you there. Well, I've done and that was a one-woman show. The thing show. about the one, yes, in one-person presentations, the, the cast parties are really boring. Mm. <laughs> Not if you know the people that I know. <laughs> But I wanted to ask you because you have a great passion for animals. And you and I worked with a great Betty White whose whole life, other than performing, was about animals. I I co-hosted the zoo fundraiser with her several years in a row. But you worked with her on a more like grassroots level of raising for all kinds of charities. Well, Betty uh, uh, White was also an only child. Like mm. myself. From the Midwest. And as was I. Too, right? From the Midwest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As was Fritz, I. Yes. really? It explains so much about me. Wow. After you get to know me. Wow. Right. I know, but, you know, only children are real, usually sno- snobby, and it's all about them, and, you know. Garrett, our intern is an only child. Garrett, our intern. Do you have, do you have a intern? special love for animals? I love it. So yes. maybe only children really. Oh, that's a really, because it's right. the companionship of yeah. being an only child. And and my dad rescued animals as a cop. Oh. You know, if there was a dog that came across, he'd stop traffic. He'd oh. pick up the dog. He'd oh. bring it home. We'd find a home for he'd it be or he'd find the owner. He'd a sensation. So, Animal rescues on TikTok. Check into it. Oh, Tell really? me what you You'll would like to night. plug or call attention to now in your animal work that we could mention. Well, I think I would have to, you know, align myself with uh, Ricky Gervais Mm -hmm. because he's a huge, huge animal rights activist. Mm. And he will, um, unfortunately, you know, the language is something I wouldn't use, but um, it's about abuse, Mm. you know, and about, you know, animals, children, children and animals. It's about what you have. Mm-hmm. It's love. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's the bottom Pure. line to everything. It's the bottom line to everything. But these it is the bottom line to everything. But these innocents, cats, dogs, children, they mm-hmm. have no voice and no choice. No. Mm-hmm. So abuse is horrific mm-hmm. to children. Well, what's the name elder of the organiz- abuse? Does he have his own organization? Oh, Ricky Gervais, he's, he's huge. But I mean, is, is there a name of his group? or You know, to be perfectly honest, I don't know. But the, the organization that I do know is Best Friends Animal Sanctuary in Kanab, Utah. Okay. They have over 1,500 animals. Uh, I met them 30 years ago in Malibu when they started out with a card table and giving $5. And I happened to be on China Beach about nurses in Vietnam with Dana Delaney, Mark Helgenberger, Michael Boatman, Jeff Kober. Terrific gr- group of I love actors, that show. and so um, uh, Francis Batista founded it, and married a, uh, a lovely uh, <laughs> woman, Silva Batista, and they both followed their dream together. I mean, from a card table in front of Hughes, mm. which used to be 
you know, which is now Ralph's mm, sure. in Malibu, mm-hmm. $5, $10. Now they have this unbelievable sanctuary, uh, 1,500 animals, oh. wolves, a rooster that has been abused. It leaves L.A. and they take them from, by car. They come every month by car and they take animals that have been abused, the unadoptables, the unmentionables, you know, the ones that have and the have-nots. Uh, and they bring a car, and then they drive them back mm. to a, a Kanab, Utah, and find homes for them. Wow. If they are unadoptable, they keep them there the rest of their lives. Okay. I think Southern Can't California has one friends. of the great mm-hmm. pet overpopulation problems in the world. And I never realized the, the intensity until about... 20 years ago. Spay neuter, you mean? Spay neuter. You know, since I've been in broadcasting, we used to do these PSAs. Be sure to spay and neuter your cats and dogs. And I never got the sense of how important that was. And then I went to adopt a golden retriever. Mm -hmm. And I went to Friends of Pets in Sun Valley Ah. where they they housed uh, water dogs, Weimaraners, uh, Labradors, and golden retrievers. And so I went in there, and there were like 200 dogs in this facility. (sighs) And I walked in there, and every one of those dogs thinks for a brief second, this guy's here to take me out of here. And they bark and yelp. And I I found this dog that was a year old. He had not been abused. He was with a farm. And this was when there was a financial downturn. And these people had several dogs. And they couldn't couldn't afford to take care of him. So they put him in there. But they weren't in any way abused. And he was my best friend for 12 years. But I... I do become your best friend. It's so... It's... It's important for people to understand, instead of buying purebreds, how overpopulated we are with pets that need homes. And, Absolutely, and yeah. they get and you really, you know, you must go to the shelter. I there, there's yes. no other choice, and uh, or if you go online on the website, they have Labrador Retriever uh, adoptions. They mm-hmm. have purebreds that they dump. Mm-hmm. And you can find a gorgeous lab, a gorgeous, uh, if you're into pit bulls, um, and I, you know, I love the pit. Uh, I think they get a bad rap because the gangs in L.A. fight them it's for no reason at all. It's how they train them, right? I mean, they, they don't have to be as nasty No, they as do not have to be. And I've known be. only, I mean, every pit I've ever met was <laughs> so friendly, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like... Will Will Rogers says I haven't met a man I didn't like, <laughs> and and it's so true. I haven't met a dog I didn't like. I haven't met a cat I didn't like. Squirrels. I mean, you know, you have a little peanut, they come up to you. They don't. They are so. And that's what you said before, Fritz. They're non-judgmental. They don't care the color of your skin. They don't care your religion. They don't care how much money you have. They just care about what you said. Love. love and response. my mom and dad were all about love. And so we always had animals. Tell. And I'm I absorbed all of that. Now it doesn't mean that I didn't observe pain mm-hmm. as a child. Not that my parents were abusive, they weren't. But you know, I, I would see animals that people would throw from a car. Or Young kids walking with their parents would kick a cat or a pigeon mm. for no reason. I'm thinking, oh, it all begins at home. Yeah, that, 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 that all goes, those kids are story in right there. Absolutely, going on there. all yeah. begins at home. But spay mm-hmm. neuter. I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, a, a friend of mine just found seven kittens abandoned in a shopping cart in Hawthorne. She yeah. took all of them in. She and you have to make sure it's a no-kill shelter, too. Absolutely. And that's what Best Friends has been doing for years because they want no-kill by 2025 or 2030. Wonderful. And they, all of their shelters here, the Best Friends animal shelters here in L.A., are all no-kill. They're not only in L.A. You find them nationally and internationally. Wonderful. They will go to Greece before the... Um, um, Olympics, and they will take all these dogs because, unfortunately, some countries do, uh, do not follow the rules. Mm-hmm. They don't spay, they don't neuter. So you have all these unbelievable dogs running around the streets. So in order to make the Olympus, Olympics look fabulous, Best Friends goes in and takes all these dogs off the streets, off the streets mm-hmm. of Greece, off the streets of Mexico, wherever they happen to be doing these big, huge Olympian events. 
so everything looks lovely. And the only reason they have, you know, the, uh, tons of animal and cats and dogs and everything else is because they did not spay or neuter. But they have to make it look really sweet and clean. And the animals suffer. Yeah, They suffer. They feel pain. Every country needs a Bob Barker. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. I'm going to have to read our closing credits because I think we're out of time. All right, golly. I think I talked too much. No, no you, you were just a, You were just unbelievable. Right. It was wonderful. You guys are unbelievable. I love you both. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Here thank come you, your... Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Dina. Thank you, Dina. Of course, Dina. Norman. And, and, and thank, thank you, you Norman. Thank you so much for joining us. We would love to continue this conversation with you on Instagram and Twitter, or we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full video podcast episodes loaded with bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. Please subscribe. You can write to us at Media Path Podcast at gmail.com. And if you enjoyed this show, please give us a nice rating in Apple Podcasts and talk about us on social media. You can sign up for our spicy little newsletter at mediapathpodcast.com and we want to thank our beautiful and wonderful guest Conchetta Tomei our team includes producer Dina Friedman John Maddox Bill Filipiak Thomas Hubble Mason Brown Lori DeWall Garrett Arch Chris Baldwin Jordan Reyes and you our theme music is by me and John Maddox I am Louise Planker here with Fritz Coleman and Conchetta Tomei be well and wise and we will see you along the media path